Hello everybody. So we're going to continue our discussion of Python under the hood today and we're going to focus on uh, data itself, variables, and types. And last time we introduced a new way of thinking about Python programs which was situating them in the context of the greater computer itself. Now we said every computer has basically followed this uh, architecture of for the since the 40s and 50s which is that you have your input and your output devices and then in the middle you have a brain which is the central processing unit that does all the computations and it you have memory where the data resides that these computations are done upon right so the python itself you need to think of it as a machine a program that's sitting there running and it sends instructions to the CPU to do things like add and subtract and do Boolean comparison and assign variables. And then you have memory, which is where those values, the data values live over extended periods of time. Right? And you know, the fact that Python is like a program and is running inside this computer is really what Alan Turing is famous for. He came up with a computer and a definition of what it means to be a computer. And what made his definition so special is it's a computer that can run any sort of program, right? As long as that program is in a specific format and has certain properties. And that's what's so magical about computers themselves and makes them better than calculators. They can run any sort of program as long as that program fits certain properties. Okay. But anyway, we also introduced a new way of looking at Python programs in terms of what variables are and how they relate to memory. And what we said was, when you create, have a variable assignment like this, remember variable assignments and assignment statements in Python evaluate right to left. So we do the right hand side of the equal sign first. So Python creates a value called 42 somewhere in memory, in the physical memory. It turns on those ones and zeros that encode the number 42 as an integer that Python understands. And then it cr assigns the variable, the answer to that. And what the answer really is, is it's a named bookmark. And that bookmark points to the address in memory where this value lives. Okay, And then we also did a tracing exercise where we're trying to make sure that we really can understand when variable values are created and destroyed. Okay? So today we're going to explore variables and data and memory a little bit more and we're going to switch over to PyCharm to do that. Okay, So we're, I'm going to walk you through these steps. Um, so let's switch over to PyCharm now and get started. So I already have PyCharm open here. Let me make it a little bit bigger so you all can see it. Okay. And the first thing I'm going to do, actually before I even go to PyCharm, I'm going to go to my desktop. And here I have my handy dandy CSC231 folder, which everyone else should have. Whoops. And inside of it, I will make a new folder and I'll call this folder lab01. Um, you can call it whatever you want. Of course, uh, Windows is going to go slow on me for some reason. Probably, you know, it knows I'm recording. It knows I'm on the spot. Okay, so I've got a new folder here. I'll call it Lab Zero. Okay. You can call yours Lab whatever you want. Okay, let's go back to PyCharm now. And I am going to open up that folder I just created. Okay, so mine is in my desktop, CSC231. And you may have noticed when I first got here, Lab01 wasn't showing. If you know that you made the folder and you know you're in the right spot, click this little refresh button up at the top. It'll make sure that it appears. Okay, so I'm going to open up the Lab01 folder. PyCharm asks me, do I want to do it in this window or a new window? Either one is fine. I'm going to do this window. All right, so I got my blank PyCharm project here, nothing in it. Uh, let me go ahead and create a new Python file. So I right click on the folder, new Python file, and let's just call it lab01.py. Okay. okay, so here we are, I'm in a blank Python folder. Um, 
let's do some fun stuff here, right? So if I go back to my um, slides, you can grab this code, uh, at least this code here on the left-hand side, and paste it in there if you want, okay? Or you can type it. So I'm actually going to go to some to my notes here. I'm going to grab this code from slide number five. And I'm just going to paste it into PyCharm. Okay. Yeah, let me get back to my PyCharm screen. Okay, So I grabbed the code from slide five and pasted it into PyCharm, and you can do that too. Okay. Now our focus here is going to be examining this type function. Type is a built-in function of Python, and it returns a value. Specifically, it returns a string. And all I'm doing is I'm printing the type of these various uh, pieces of data. These are values that are going to be created in memory. And I ask Python, what is the type of each of these values? And it prints them out. So you've probably seen this function before, and you've probably seen the outputs of it before. 42 is class integer, uh, 3.14159, that's a float. True is a bool, it's a boolean, and Alice here is a string. Okay. So when we print out the type, it says class int. Okay. Integer, float, boolean, string. But there's also this class thing. Okay. We'll get back again to what that means in just a second. Okay, so now, next slide. Um, Let's look at another function, which is the ID function. So I'm going to manipulate this a little bit. Okay, so I just copied and pasted my code. And instead of type, I'm going to use the ID function here. Okay, it's also a find and replace feature I could have used. All right, so let's run this code. All right, so ID. ID is another built-in function. And what do I get down here? Well, I get some numbers when I print these things out. Now, what are these numbers? These numbers, if you're running basic Python that you downloaded from python.org, these numbers are the address in memory of these values that were created. Okay, so remember, whenever you run, uh, whenever you create data, it gets put into memory. Well, this ID function gives you the address in memory of data that was created. Pretty cool, huh? Let's run it again. Okay? And I want you to notice something. Notice something on my screen, and then also notice something on your screen as you run it. Note the value here of Alice. Okay? On mine, your numbers are going to be different, and that's to be expected. Okay? That's fine. But I want you to note your value for Alice. Write it down somewhere. Okay, mine is actually I'll put mine in a comment right here. Okay, let's run this code again. Now, if you remember, you can right-click anywhere in your script and click Run. I like to use the little keyboard shortcut for Windows. It's Control Shift F10. Hmm, something's different, right? Now, this ID, the location in memory is 44887520. Okay, that's different than it was before. That's because every invocation of Python that you do, every time you start up the Python interpreter and run the script and then it shuts down, it is grabbing new places in memory, new locations in memory. These values are volatile. They are not consistent. But maybe let's just take a look at this guy. What's the ID of 42? Okay, for me it's this. For you it'll be something different. Whatever it is, copy it. Note it. Let's rerun. Hmm. This value stays the same. Well, that's a little weird. Okay, well, that's because there's an optimization that Python does. Python knows that the numbers, uh, I believe it's negative... 15 through 250, something like that, are all reused. Those numbers appear a lot. So as soon as Python runs, like as soon as python.exe starts, before it even gets into your script, it puts these 
values, these special values in a place in memory and just reuses them over and over and over and over instead of creating and destroying them over and over as well. Same thing for true. True will be in the same location. Okay, So that's kind of neat. What I want you to take away though, we've got the type function that will tell you what kind of data you're dealing with and you've got the ID function which will tell you where in memory it resides. Now usually however we don't think of memory addresses as integers. Usually they are referred to using uh, hexadecimal, right? So let's, hex is another function that is built into Python, right? So what I'm going to do is wrap this value in a hex. Ooh, okay, so what are we doing here? We've got the id function. These are nested function calls. Okay. And recall, so the parentheses operator in this context is a function call. Parentheses operators, you know, they're grouping. You do the inside first and then work your way out just like you do in algebra. So it evaluates this, which gives you an integer. Okay, so it's going to give you an integer like this. And then it's going to call hex on this integer and that's going to give you something else. It's going to give us a whole bunch of stuff that looks like this. And then we print it. Okay? So we're, we don't have to store the return value. Right? We could do something like um, the ID gets ID 42 or 43. And then we could do hex value gets hex the ID. And then we can finally print hex value. We could do that, but we don't need to. And actually it's kind of wasteful to do that. Because generally, this is a general rule of thumb, something to remember. You only need a variable to put a value in a variable if you reference it from more than one place. Okay, so I'm referencing the ID only in one place. It's kind of wasteful. I don't need it. I can just replace the value of the ID with its computed value. Same thing for hex value. I don't need this variable, right? I only need the value that comes back from this function, right? So it's a little optimization to keep in mind, right? So that's what I'm doing here, a nested function call. Uh, let me wrap the rest of these in the hex function because, again, this is the way that uh, memory addresses are conventionally referred to. They are conventionally uh, referenced using hexadecimal format. And you should have learned what hexadecimal format is. It's base 16, right? So here's what mine look like, right? This is just my integer values converted into this hexadecimal format. Now, I believe I must be running 32-bit Python. If you see a value that is much bigger than this, if you have a much longer string, that's okay. That means you're running 64-bit Python. Uh, don't worry about it. The difference isn't terribly important right now. Okay, But this is how we normally view memory addresses. All right. So, cool, cool. Uh, we're just reinforcing the idea here that, let me get this out of the way and let me kind of get back to my presentation screen. We're just reinforcing the idea here that um, variables, values exist in memory and you can get the memory address if you want to. Okay, So, a lot of code. Let's take a look at a different actual visualizer of this thing. So what I want you to do is open up a web browser and go to this site here, pythontutor.com. Okay. And let me get my web browser up. Bring it over here. How are we looking on the screen? Not too bad. All right. So this is pythontutor.com. It was written by Philip Guo when he was at Stanford. He's a very smart guy. Very cool thing. Um, I this is a really great tool. And especially if you're a visual thinker, um, I encourage you to use this website, especially if you're stuck on something and values aren't coming out the way you want and you just need a break from looking at code and it would be helpful to look at something visual. Check this place out. Um, so 
pythontutor.com. I'm going to click on start visualizing your code now. And that will take me to this screen. Now before you do anything, I want you to go to the live programming mode. So click this button down here, live programming mode. All right. You're going to see something that looks similar, but it will say here at the top, this mode is experimental. All right. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some information in here. Uh, at, oh, sorry, before I do that, uh, look down, scroll down a little bit. Down here there's a couple of uh, drop-down boxes. Change this one in the middle that says render all objects on the heap. Make sure yours says that. Make sure it says render all objects on the heap. The default is something else. Okay, Render all objects on the heap this one. All right, so now we're in some code. Um, I am going to, if you switch over to slide number nine, there's some code in there, and I'm going to grab it and paste it in here. Okay. All right, so this is code. You can find it on slide nine. You can type it in. Go grab it, paste it into this editor. So what is my code doing? I am printing a string. I'm saying print the address of value 42 at hex ID 42, right? So 42, the data value 42 lives at some integer memory address, convert that to hex and now print it. Okay. Now I assign, let's, let's run this in real time. Okay. Down at the bottom you have some controls here. Click where it says first. Okay. You see a little arrow here? This is kind of like our tracing exercise. It's getting ready to execute this first line of code, and you can think of this as the instruction memory. It's getting ready to execute it, and after it executes, it's going to show you the value of all variables in memory. Okay, so let's go next. So what do we see? We've got the printed output, but you'll notice there's nothing in memory, right? No variables were created. The implication is that this 42 was kind of created, it was used, and Python forgot about it. Right? It's gone. Nobody. I didn't assign a variable value to it. Right? All right. So we've just executed this line, line one. That's green. We're getting ready to execute line two. So let's do that. Click next down here. All right, so what has happened? I got this thing on the left called the frame. Okay, the frame, think of the frame as an address book. The global frame is the address book for the variables that are in the main part of your program. Okay. I've created a variable x and it is pointing to the value 42 in memory. Okay, all right, cool. No output has been produced yet. But this is what happened. Draw this link in your brain. When you do a variable assignment, x gets 42, we're connecting the variable x to the place in memory where the thing lives. How do we know that? Check out this next line of code, line 3. Address, I'm going to print out the address referred to by x. Print id x and convert it to hexadecimal. So I'm getting the id of the variable x. What do you expect to see? Well, x is pointing to the location, the address of the value 42 in memory. Right? And what is the value of x? Okay, so when you do this, print the value of x, and you just give a variable value, right? Here I'm printing a variable. If you do addition, x plus y, division, x divided by y, if you put a variable in a string, what you are really doing, this is so important for you to understand, what you are really doing is taking this variable, going to its address in memory, and seeing what the value there in memory is. Okay, The value of x is 42 because that's the digits, that's the bits, that's what's in memory at this address. Okay, So, so, so important that you understand this. Right? X right here 
says go to the address in memory pointed to by x and get the value that's there okay x itself is not a value it holds a memory address right let's do another example so go to slide 10 in the slides and you'll see this code right here um, I'm not going to step through. It's the exact same code, except I'm dealing with a float, 3.14159. Right? Um, actually, if I go back and I run it, I should get a slightly different address, too. can walk forward and backward. Kind of cool. Okay. So, again, I've created a variable called... I've created a value, 3.14159. I assign pi to 3.14159. So... Python, once it creates a data value, it's kind of smart enough to reuse it if it's already in memory, if it knows it's in memory somewhere. Right? Um, hex ID of pi, pi is pointing to this thing. But you'll note as well, Python knows this thing is a float. That's very important. Python knows that the thing living here is a float. If you go back to the old code with the integers, can I just undo here, I think? Nope, can't undo in PyTutor, at least only limited amounts. If you go back and you put the code from a couple minutes ago, this will say int, right, when we were dealing with 42. All right, now, really important, really important, maybe the most important thing of today, okay? Go grab the code from slide number 11 and paste it in here, okay? Go ahead and pause while you're doing that. And once you've done it, once you've done it, go back to the beginning. Restart. Click the first button, okay? All right. So you should have the code from slide number 11, and you should have started over again, okay? So let me step over here. We're going to walk through this line by line, just printing out the address of the value 42. Okay, no problem. I assign the variable x to point to that address. All right, cool. So I've got the value 42 and I've got the variable x pointing to it. Now, this statement, line number seven, what happens? What do you think happens? I've got y gets x. What's gonna happen? What's gonna happen over here? in this block. Well, what's going to happen is I create a new variable in my global frame, my address book, and I say point to the same place x points to. Y, I'm going to create Y and point to this x lookup right here. A variable value by itself returns a memory address. Okay. X point y, I want you to point to x. Okay, So now x and y are pointing to the same address in memory. They are, there is only 142 in memory. Okay, And you can see that. Go ahead and run these prints. If we print the address of x and we print the address of y, they are the same. One data value in memory, two variables pointing to the same location. Okay, very interesting, very important. A lot of ramifications to that, okay? So, and we'll see some of those ramifications at a later date, but very important. What's gonna happen now if I do x gets 3.14159? What do you think's gonna happen? What's gonna happen over here? What happens to x and what happens to y? Let's see. Boom. We have a new float that was created in memory, and x now points to it. But y still points to 42. Okay. Look at their memory addresses. They're different. x is pointing somewhere new. y points to the old place. Okay. Super important. Okay. Very interesting. 
Now you may have heard the terms mutable and immutable data types. Integers, floats, strings, these are all immutable. Immutable is a 10 cent word that means you can't change it. Can't change it. Mutable data types are things like lists and dictionaries. Mutable meaning you can change the value. We're talking about values, not data, right? So when we did x gets 3.14159, x was pointing to 42, but 42 is an immutable data type. You cannot change it. You cannot change the value at that address location. So Python says, oh, this guy, he is immutable. I can't just replace him here. Integers are immutable. I can't replace this value. What I have to do, this is Python talking, is create a new value and then point x to it. That's what happens. If we did, were working with lists here, this would be a different ball game. Okay, lists are mutable. But this is the essence of immutability in Python. You cannot change the value. You can reassign variables all you want, that's fine, but you cannot change values. Okay, values live in memory, variables point to values in memory. You have to now make that distinction. Okay, you have to draw that line. Before variables and values Wishy, washy, same, but they're not the same. Draw that distinction, okay? Big concept. Let it digest in your brain. All right, I'm going to switch back to uh, my slides here for a minute, if I can. There we go. All right, so recap here. Data are bits that represent something, like the number 42 or 3.14159. These are data or values, okay? Think of values, data are the same thing, data and values. When you create data in Python, it puts these bits in computer memory somewhere. Where in memory? Where do these things go? That's an interesting question. Um, Python does it for you. You don't have to worry about it. But the way it works is, remember our notional machine? We had this thing called heap memory. Python's got this big pile of memory just sitting on a plate next to it. And whenever it needs to create a value, it says, hey, give me a, it, it grabs something off the plate and scribbles in it, says, 42, you're here. But that little something it grabbed, that little box, has an address. And that's how it knows, right? So the heap... Python says, I need a new value, and it says, heap, I need some place to put it, and the heap says, here's a place in memory you can put it, and that's the address. Right? The variables, then, is Python saying, all right, x, I'm going to name this address x so I can look at it later. Okay. Super important that you have that view of variables, data values, and memory moving forward. Okay, I want to look at uh, one more thing, kind of one more uh, trick in Python, and that is sys.getSizeOf. So I'm going to go over here to uh, PyCharm again. Okay. I'm going to be back in PyCharm. I'm going to go ahead and delete the stuff I had before. And I'm going to use, first of all, I'm going to add this statement called import sys to the top. So you've may have seen this before, maybe not, um, probably have. Import, and then this is what is known in Python as a module. Modules are related groups of functions um, that you might find useful. You probably used the math module before. Uh, what I can do is I've created a variable and a value here. I've created a value, more precisely, and assigned a variable to point to it. And sys dot get size of, this is a function. I probably need to do something like print that. Okay. And what this gives me back is the number of bytes that are required to represent this number, 3.14156. Okay. Not sure why that's 6. <laughs> but anyway, 3.14156. Um, I got to change it. It's, it's going to drive me bonkers, right? There we go. Thank goodness. Um, so this is the number of bytes, remember 8 bits in a byte, 
that it takes to represent this number in memory. That's a lot, right? It takes 16 bytes, 16 times 8, right? Bits to represent this number. Um, let's try, let's do something else. Let's do 42, right? 42 takes 14 bytes. Uh, let's do a million. A million takes 16 bytes. Let's do, oh, can't do that. Let's do this. Is that going to work? Oh, I still got an L in there. Don't worry. Just mash a bunch of numbers. 26 bytes. So the bigger my integers get, uh, the more bytes it takes to represent them. Right? I'm just typing in some integers here. And you can kind of see this growing. You may see different numbers, and that's okay. That's okay. Um, how about a string? All right. Let's do print sys.get size of the string Alice. Alice takes 30 bytes to represent. Wow, right? Alice, five characters. This number, I don't even know how to describe it. Only took 26 bytes. Alice took 30. Whoa. Well, computers are really good at representing numbers. The way that it Python stores uh, strings, very complicated, right? Very complicated. Um, let's make the string bigger. Alice in Wonderland. 44 bytes. Okay. Decent amount. Um, so I want to show you one more kind of interesting thing. Let's try sys.get size of, let's do a different float. Let's do 34.4. They're both 16. All right, let's do another one. I just duplicated this line. So if you hit Control D or Command D, it'll duplicate the line your cursor's on. It could be very useful. Let's type a much bigger float like this. Still 16. Interesting. Let's do a really small float. Yours might be 32. That's OK. All these are the same, right? Turns out the way that the data that Python represents floating points is consistent, and it doesn't matter. You know, floating point, their name derives from the fact of where this decimal point is represented inside the computer. Okay. Just a fun fact, you would learn if you're taking CSC242 computer organization, you'll learn how floats are represented inside a machine. It's kind of interesting, but you know, just realize that yeah, floats are a fixed size in data land, but integers and strings in Python, they can grow. Okay. All right. So um, let's uh, switch to it, where I'll leave off with all of this is that just be aware that the different data types, you know, 42, whether it's an integer, whether it's a Boolean, whether it's a string, don't worry about typing this. Just be aware that these things occupy different amounts of memory. That's the important thing to take away here. All right, so one last thing. One last, but holy cow, a very important thing. I'm going to go back to my Python tutor in live mode. And let's grab a string. Okay, so if you go to slide number 15, slide number 15, grab that code and paste it in here. Okay. So I've got some code here that is going to, it just creates a uh, string that looks like this. I've got Alice with some white space around her. It's got some blanks, some tab characters, some new lines. And you can see when I print it, it's got some gunk in there. Let me expand this a little bit. Okay. But nonetheless, you know, I can get the memory address of that this variable points to. I can convert it to hex. I see here, I'm printing out the type, and I'm seeing here that the type of name, the type of data value that name variable points at is a class string. Okay. Well, let's manipulate this string a little bit. Okay. Let's, uh, let's do the following. Um, let's do x gets name dot strip, right? We talked about, uh, oh, I don't like that. And let's print x. Okay. Don't like that it keeps resizing on me, but that's okay. 
Remember, in our, uh, go, if you don't recognize the strip method or strip function, go back to the uh, last week's module and check out the, the string functions. But what name.strip does is it removes leading and trailing white space. Right? But strings are immutable, remember? Uh, it was one of our immutable data types. So the string here, name, or Alice, is not getting changed itself. Instead, name.strip returns a copy of Alice with all this white space removed. Okay. Same if we were to do like y gets name dot, let's do y gets name dot upper and then print y. So here, y gets x dot upper, we took x, which points to this string, and told it to go uppercase. That's what upper does. Right? And that result is assigned to y, and we print it. Okay? So I've got three different copies of kind of my original string, but they've been modified in a different way because string is immutable. Okay? But, all right, let's let's... Take a deep breath, because this part is really, really, really important. Okay, Let's take a deep breath, shake it off, get up, walk around for a minute, grab a glass of water, take, a, take five, okay? Because this is going to be really important, what's coming up next. Okay. <sighs> My deep breath. Name dot strip. Okay. What is that? Exp specifically. What is this weird little dot that we have seen? You've probably seen this, you know, you see it when you deal with lists, you've seen it when you've dealt with strings. What in the heck is this weird little dot, right? By the way, you don't have to use this dot on just, um, you don't have to use this dot on a variable. You can use it on literal on the value itself you can do alice dot lower right take the string alice and dot lower it give me the result of this computation you get little alice back right what in the heck is this dot thing right what is it okay so what it is is that this thing that is put into memory, right? Those bytes that we just looked at, you know, the 14 bytes for the integer and so on. It's more than just a data and a value. There are also operations that you can perform on that data, right? Okay. Um, recall, when you type type, right? You type a variable or type a value, you get something that says, class and then string or int or float class okay what does this mean okay what this is really telling you is that alice this string here is more than just a value all programming languages have a concept of data types data types are consisting of two things the data okay so the character's Alice, that's the data, and operations, the things you can do to or with that data. Okay, so this thing here, right, it says class string. And what does this mean? Classes are a Python language feature that provide the means of bundling together data value and the operations the things you can do that value together defining a class creates a new data type in Python okay data types are data and operations classes are how Python creates data types class is actually a keyword we'll see it next time so the Python stir class, this guy, holds the data that make up the letters and several operations, which are technically called methods, for manipulating the data. 
A method is the same thing as a Python function except that it is defined on a particular class. Okay. If you go to the string, the definition of a Python string, right, there are many, many, many string class uh, methods. Whew. What that little dot is, is the way of accessing the operations. Okay, so before we've been thinking of variables, we've been thinking of classes, we've been thinking of values, we've been thinking of these things that we create in memory as the values, but they are more than that. They are more. They are also operations. And that is what those little dot blah 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 things are. Sys dot get size of. String dot split list dot append those are operations and in python those are called methods okay methods are a lot like functions but they belong to something they belong to a particular data type wow okay that's kind of crazy right so when you create data what you are making are multiple instances of a class with different data but the same functions, Whew. or same methods is what it should really say, same operations, okay? So suppose you've got X gets Alice, Y gets Bob, Z gets Chuck, okay? You will see these are all instances of a string, 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 string class, string class, string class, different instances but they have different values, okay? However, you can do dot upper on X, you can do dot upper on Y, you can do dot upper on Z, and it will all do the same thing to the data, okay? So the, in your classes, in your data types for Python, each time you create a value you are creating an instance of a data type and those instances have different values but you can do the same things to different instances of the same type so all of these guys know what upper means they all know what lower means they all know what strip means they all know what split means cool okay different classes can do different things right so if you have an integer class, I've got two integers, 42 and negative 1. If you do 42 minus 1, no problem. The integer data type knows specific. Now, remember, we're, data type and classes are kind of interchangeable terms. They are at least in Python. So if I say data type, you think class. If I think class, you think data type. They're the same thing. just turns out that cl data type is a more... Um, general concept. Class is the Python specific word for it, okay. Different classes can do different things. So integers, for example, know how to subtract from one another. But strings do not know how to subtract from one another. And if you do this, go type it in PyCharm, you will see something that says type error. Type as in data type. Type error. Unsupported operand types for the difference sign, the subtraction. String and string. This is Python's very non-intuitive way of saying strings don't know how to subtract from one another. Sorry, you can't do it. Okay, Because I went into the data type for string and I said, hey, subtract yourself from this other guy. And Python said, nope, don't know how to do that. Okay, So data types, again, different data types have different operations they can do. All right, so instances of classes, go back to our visualization here, instances of classes are generically referred to as objects, okay? Objects in memory. Everything in Python is an object. Every variable you have ever created, every uh, value you have ever computed is stored in memory as an object. Okay, so say it with me. Everything, everything 
in Python is an object. The number 5, the number 42, the float 3.1416, the boolean true, the string Alice, they are all objects in memory. These objects are instances of different classes. They are instances of different data types. But collectively, when they're living in memory, we say they are objects in memory. Ooh, heady stuff, heady stuff, okay? So let me wrap up on this slide. This is probably the most important lecture of the whole semester. So if you have to watch it five times until you get it, please do. Ask me questions, okay? Data types appear in every programming language. They are comprised of the data they store and the operations that can be performed on the data. Okay, this is a step up in our understanding of what Python does and how it works. Creating a class in Python defines a new data type, class string, class bool, class int. And Python has many built-in classes, and you've been using them already, but maybe not fully appreciating what's going on with them. Okay? When you declare or use a variable, Python creates an object in computer memory that is an instance of a class. This class instance holds particular values, it holds particular data, but all the different instances of the same class know the same operations. Upper, split, strip, all strings can do it. The location of the object in memory is given by its memory address. Okay, lot of big time concepts. Study, study, study. Know the difference. Everything that's underlined on the screen, it's vocabulary. Know what they are. Okay. Um, use the Python tutor on maybe some of your old programs to really concretize what these different things mean. Okay. It's important that you have a good visual model of them. Um, so, so far in your career, you have used Python's built-in classes, things that Python ships with, int, string, float, list, program. Next week, next time, we are going to learn how to make our own data types using, our, using Python's class feature. Okay? Talk to you next time. Again, study all this stuff and hit me up with the questions you have. Good luck.